Good morning. Good morning. Everybody is still kind of bad. Okay, we'll try not to be too boring. Uh, let's see. Uh, next generation of data stores, um, hot queries, cold storage. Uh, let's see if we all had the same thing in mind what happens in this talk, but um, we see. So, um, for my background, I work at Elastic, the company behind Elasticsearch. Um, we are investing heavily into this world as well, so that's kind of like my, my background to that. Um, my general question is like, who uses data stores? And I assume everybody will raise their hand now. And then the next question is like, who likes managing data stores? And that's normally when all the hands go down or you make this gesture, right? Uh, and then everybody's like, hmm, I don't know. Like, I, I'm not sure why I want to manage data stores. And uh, the question is kind of like, why is it such a pain to manage data stores? Or where is, where is the problem coming from? Or yes, we all need them, but nobody wants to run them, right? And maybe it's the old thing where you say, oh, it's an ops problem now, and good luck. And we just pick the data stores, and you have to run that. Uh, but why are data stores such a painful thing to run, or where is that problem coming from? And I think in part it's because of the, the I call it the classic architecture that we have all used when building something. And a lot of my examples will be kind of tied to Elasticsearch because that's the system that I know really well, but this will apply to pretty much any data store system that you have. So let's assume we have a distributed data store. We have three nodes here, and we have some data that we have split in shards. So we have one, let's keep it simple. We say that one table or index that we split into multiple shards. So I have three primary shards, uh, shard zero, one, two, and then I have replication of those shards, like this is replication of shard zero, one, and two. And these are distributed, and it's a distributed system that works as expected, right? So you have the data, if one of the nodes goes down, you have all the data replicated on another node, which could be automatically promoted. And in theory, this is all nice and works great, and it should make operation easy, but it kind of doesn't. Right? And why, why is it often such a problem to manage the data? Um, I think in part because depending on how the system works, um, in the case of Elasticsearch, for example, there is one node that we, for historic reasons, call the master node um, that basically manages the cluster state and it knows like which shards are located where and what is the structure of the shard and what is kind of like the, the metadata and state of this, this node. And like, this is a component that is often, I don't want to say brittle, but it's like if something happens to that, it doesn't matter that you have all the data nicely sitting somewhere, you kind of like, it's the map to the data. So if something with that happens, your cluster will have a very bad day. And yes, this is also like a thing that is a, like shared across the nodes, and if that one dies, another node will promote itself to be the master node. But it's still like there are a lot of moving parts in that, and if communication, break somewhere, like I assume everybody knows the cap theorem, consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. If the network breaks, in theory, it all works, but in practice, sometimes you get stuck in a weird state. And all of this makes operating data stores kind of hard, also extending storage, and just managing that storage, and managing all the nodes in conjunction. So you don't really want to have that, or it's like we are very used to that, and I always call it the Stockholm Syndrome, that you get so used to something that you say this is the only way and the right way to do something, but maybe it's not actually what you want to do. Um, and then there is uh, the great promise, I want to say, of our industry, which is called serverless. And yeah, there is the old joke, there are servers in serverless, yes. The point is more that the servers are managed by somebody else. And I'll build up to what that means for data stores over the next few slides. I assume pretty much everybody is familiar with the, ter ser sorry, with the term serverless. Or if you want to explain that to somebody, I always like this example where you say we have pizza as a service because in IT everybody likes pizza and then you have these multiple options. So you could have blue is for self-managed and green is managed by somebody else. And then you have this thing where you have like the homemade pizza where you buy everything from the, the flour to the toppings and whatever, and you make the entire pizza at home yourself from scratch. And that is pretty much like you have your infrastructure or you have your own data center where you manage the hardware, the software, and everything around it. And then you might have like the, the take and bake um, 
And I know that the Italians will not be very happy about that, that, but the rest of the world often eats frozen pizza and then warms it up at home. So it's kind of like the next step. Then you would have the, the delivery that you get the pizza delivered to your home, or you go to the restaurant that's kind of like the, the serverless model almost. You have outsourced all the work. You just show up, you eat, and you go. And for, for computing, this would be, um, this is kind of like your, your own data center that you manage. This might be an, an EC2 instance or a virtual server that where somebody else manages the hardware, but you do the software and the operating system and everything yourself. This might be maybe Kubernetes, where you have abstracted everything away behind an API, um, but you still need to manage a lot of things yourself, and that would then be serverless, where you basically throw your code at something and it will scale it out and run it and do everything for you, and you don't care about the infrastructure anymore. So that's kind of like the on-prem all the way up to the, the serverless setup based on pizza, but I think the, the comparison holds quite, quite well. And that is serverless. And then the other thing that often comes up is stateless. And just as with servers, serverless, there are servers with stateless and data stores. There is state, because some people are very amused, like how can you have a stateless database? Are you writing your data to death null and it will just disappear? Because maybe that's a stateless database, but that's not really the point of that. You want to have a data store where, again, somebody else manages the state for you. And then the question is, what is the, the storage standard of our industry today and has been for a couple of years? Any guesses? Yes. Sorry? Yes. Um, so I would say it's S3, that kind of like, that is where everybody puts their data and everybody has, even though it's a proprietary standard, um, everybody has implemented a, a, an API that is kind of similar to that. So I, I don't want to be Amazon specific here because you have plenty of choices. Like Google has something similar, Azure, um, DigitalOcean, you can run your own with Minio and there are tons of compatible APIs. So I think S3 is kind of like the storage standard of our industry, even though we might not want to admit that, especially when you come from an open source world or uh, it's kind of like painful that S3, this proprietary Amazon thing has kind of won. But it seems to be what, as an industry, we have more or less standardized on. And this is also where lots of players who want to say, like, we are stateless. This is where your state often goes. Um, there's one small side note, because we have had a lot of pain on uh, S3 compatible, is that what everybody does might be, or people might have very different opinions what S3 compatible might mean. So we've, in, in Elasticsearch, we have built a, an S3 repo analysis tool that basically checks if your implementation of S3 is compatible enough for us to work, because we use that for, for backups um, for a long time. But even then, we want to make sure that you support all the API calls, that the network is fast enough, that you can store large enough files, like what you would expect, because depending on the, the vendor-specific implementation, um, S3 compatible is one of the bigger lies in our industry that everybody says, yeah, we support some APIs, but the finer details are then very different. But looking at, I'll pick some GCP examples, but again, this will translate to pretty much any cloud provider or any environment. Um, in most cloud providers, you have the choice between different data stores and things. So, the object store, that is the, the S3 compatible thing um, where you can have a lot of block data and store those. You could instead have the, the block storage which, where you basically attach some storage over the network um, and use that. There's also the file storage which is normally something NFS compatible or so. Um, for most cases, this is the, the classic approach, how many people have been running data stores in the cloud that you have some network attached or maybe even local storage um, to the instance. Um, and the local data is more ephemeral and then you have persistent disk that you can mount over the network, but it also has some trade-offs um, that you, for the most part, you can only attach one for writing. Maybe you can attach that image to multiple instances for reading, but only one can write to that. And NFS, at least we have had pretty bad um, experiences around performance uh, when we try to even just run IP benchmarks if it is compatible or works, and we kind of gave up on that. So for most data stores, I think NFS is 
not a great choice. Local attach storage is kind of like the classic choice, but where everybody wants to go is blob storage just because you have this outsourcing of state. This is kind of like what most people understand if they say like we have a stateless data store. It doesn't mean there is no state, but you outsource the state to a blob store for the most part, just because management and also cost is normally very good. Um, but what are the, the trade-offs there? So durability is normally very good that you put the data there and then depending on your cloud provider, you will have, I don't know, four, five, whatever nines in terms of durability that your data will still be there, um, which might also mean that you don't need to do replication anymore because the data is guaranteed and Amazon, for example, replicates the data internally, so you don't need to care about replication itself anymore. Um, latency is often a bit worse that's a trade-off we can then discuss how much sense that makes. Um, cost, I think, depends if you have a good access pattern and you write large enough chunks of data and you don't constantly transfer them. It's potentially very cheap to run. If you have a bad access pattern, especially around network traffic that can get quite expensive across zones, um, then it might also be more expensive, but if you do it well, it can be very cheap in comparison. Um, on, on latency, um, there's, for example, Datadog had a very nice blog post a while ago um, where they described one of their homegrown data stores that's not publicly available, but you can, it's built into what Datadog is doing and it's called Husky. And they basically said like the trade-off with S3 was the, I think both the cost, uh, but also the, the management and then the, the tail latency was good and better, even though the average latency was a bit higher, but for what they wanted to do, it was more than good enough to have that slightly higher average latency, and this made a lot more sense to run their data store. And I feel like a lot of people trying to run some system in the cloud come to a similar conclusion, that while there is a trade-off and the average latency is a bit higher, if you have the right access patterns, then a blob store can perform very well and figure out, or for depending on the task, um, uh, be a good solution. The other thing that you might want to do then is and from the classical perspective, that was normally not a thing, um, that you split up storage and compute, that you have some instances that can scale up if you have more ingestion happening. Um, so you need more processing of data coming in, but you just write it out to the blob store. And then when you don't have any incoming traffic anymore, you can basically shut down that index or ingestion layer. And because you don't need to run it anymore, you just put all the data to S3, that's where it sits. And then you can scale that ingestion independently, but you can also scale the, the retrieving, reading, searching, whatever you call it, layer independently. So if, for example, you have almost no or no reads on the weekend, you can mostly reduce your reading engines, um, whereas if Monday morning hits, you can automatically or based on requests scale it up automatically and just save costs again because your data, the state is put to S3 where it is living but you can very easily scale up and down both the, the writing of the data and the reading afterwards as well um, to scale independently and go faster, but also reduce the cost down to that. Um, the other important thing here is normally that you want to have for a truly serverless or stateless system, you want to have scale to zero. So you can even say like over the weekend nothing happened, so we just shut all the compute instances down. Um, we potentially save a lot of money and energy. Um, you can still do local caching, so the, the different disk formats and access patterns, you can still exploit kind of like the locality of data that if you have like some hot reading path and you always read the same data that you cache that locally. So you get kind of like the advantage of having local disks for that. But a lot of the data can just be on the top store and you don't have to move it around all the time. And then you have like much better scale and potentially also much better cost in there. The other thing that is, I don't want to say the holy grail, but it's kind of like the thing that everybody wants to have is the paper execution that you would say that you know what one query of a user basically costs you. Um, I also feel like with ChatGPT recently that has gotten a lot more attention because there you can see like this request cost you X cents. Um, so this paper execution is an interesting model that I think a lot of people want. It has historically been very hard with uh, any other data store. Let's just say you have a Postgres instance, you have no idea what 
one query really cost you in the past that somebody was running. Or with pretty much any other data store, it was very hard to figure out the cost per request. That you could either attribute that to a specific client or a department. And so the cost was always like very much a ballpark. But with serverless and like building on these primitives, it might be much easier to actually figure out how much cost you're contributing or one specific query or the ingestion volume, how much cost it is adding to your system. Um, one thing that is also important to note here is uh, that object stores, just like the compatibility of the API, that the performance characteristics vary widely and depend very much on the data store. And again, in IT we always love abstraction, but abstraction is not magic. You still need to know what happens under the hood, and otherwise you will find out the hard way at some point. Um, and object stores are no different. So for every cloud provider, for example, there are different um, like limits that you have. For example, in GCP, if you have less than 1,000 writes uh, or 5,000 reads per second, um, you will be fine. But for example, if you need more, you will need to ramp that up over time so that the service adjusts for you. This is very cloud provider specific. I don't think S3 from Amazon, for example, has something like that. And I haven't seen anything on Azure either. But GCP is pretty um, explicit about that, that you basically start around these numbers and you can double them approximately every 20 minutes. But if you know that you will have a lot of load coming in, you will need to load, uh, warm up your system over the right amount of time to actually scale to approximately that load so that you will be in a good state and not just get um, server errors back. Um, the other thing, and that is more evil or equal around cloud providers, this in small variations basically applies to S3 um, or Amazon and Azure as well, just as to GCP, is that you want to avoid hotspotting because, well, like we said, there are still servers behind the scenes, um, so somehow they need to distribute the data and handle all the requests. And if you have a hotspot in your data, so for example, if you have a naming convention and then you have like you create a, a bucket and then you just increment the bucket name by one or you it just has the date in it, then you will always have a lot of locality. For example, if you have a bucket where you write all the data into a single bucket today, but you read over the last year, the write bucket, there will always be one bucket that will get 99% or more of all the write requests. So you always have this hotspot there. And that's a pattern that you should generally avoid because there is all the hardware down there and it will not magically solve that problem. There is some distribution mechanism, but normally it, it does not, um, well, if you have a naming convention that goes always to the same place, you will be in trouble. Um, other systems have apply or use a workaround for that. Anybody knows how other systems work around that? Where you have the sequential naming? So for example, in, in Elastic, we we would have like the ID that is the distribution key, we would hash that. So even if you just increment the, the, the value by one, through the hash function it would evenly distribute that over the entire key space and you can avoid problems. Uh, from what I've read, that is not how the, most of the blob stores work, uh, but if you have like a, like a prefix and you always have the same prefix and then add some, some consistent pattern in increments, um, you will have a hotspotting problem because the data will always end up in the same place. Um, so those are things you just need to figure out and understand if you have enough load and data, because otherwise you will suffer from the shortcomings of the implementation, even though you don't know it or haven't seen it, uh, but you will feel it at some point that there is hotspotting on the hood. Um, the, the other thing, of course, that is still a thing is round trips are still expensive. So if you put your blob storage in the US and you will try to retrieve the data in Europe, the physics of round trips and the network latency doesn't change. Um, so locality of having blob store or instant store is still a thing, so you cannot work around that. And then depending on the cloud provider, you will have often different access, <coughs> sorry, uh, different access classes um, where infrequent access is cheaper but might have more latency um, or might only be available after some time. Those are normally obviously not very good for data stores where you want to have data available very quickly and also very with a very high durability. Um, so that's probably not what you want to optimize there for. Um, but 
a lot of different cloud providers or data stores um, in their cloud implementations um, support some kind of serverless stateless implementation. So for example, for Postgres there is Neon, which is I think an open source implementation um, that is exactly going for a blob store in the background. You go by DB, Cockroach, ClickHouse Cloud, um, Firebolt Cloud, and there are many more because the, the general pattern of outsourcing the storage and the state to F3 is just so appealing um, to do that. And we are no exception. I Just to give you an idea of how the Elasticsearch kind of like looks, this is the, the old way of doing stuff, and this is like how, how we see blob stores and how we want to use those. And this already looks slightly messy, but you can see it has almost all the problems of like a, the classic distribution model. So just to, to show that the, the blue error here, this is a, a write, and the orange error, this is a read. So when the data comes in from your client, you write the data, and then you might have the, the so-called hot layer. This is where you do most of your writes and reads. And you can see we have a primary and replica. So you, we need to write all the data twice at least for high availability because if that instance here dies, um, then we still have the other copy. But you always write all the data twice. Um, and then at some point you might say like, oh, I move this to the cold state where I, I have my data read only, so I'm not doing any writes and I do fewer reads. I move that to an instance with more, more density or like larger disks and less CPU. Maybe you have already backed up the data, so you only need a single copy anymore. You can move it to frozen, that might be backed by an object store. But it's still, it's like data moving through different stages. You need replication, and like writes are going all over the place. This is kind of like the, the classic approach of how you were accessing data stores. Um, and the different uh, uh, tiers with hot, cold, frozen, those are highly optional. But that was kind of like a performance optimization that here, where you do all the writing and reading, or most of the reading, um, you want more CPU. Here you want to have more disks, so if the data is infrequently accessed, I always call it the compliance layer, where yeah, we need to store data for six months or 12 months or whatever, but nobody's going to search that, or at least not on a frequent basis. So for that, every now and then query, it can be quite slow. You can do some optimizations here. The idea of serverless or stateless is then, again, you can see we have the the write part is all on this side, and the, the read part is all on the other side. And the only thing in the middle is basically the blob store or S3 compatible storage layer. Um, and then you can also split up the, the writing or indexing tier and the, the searching tier, because this one here writes. And all the writes go through here. If you have more writes happening, you can scale up this layer independently of the other one. The same if you have more searches, you can independently scale up the, the search tier. Um, and go through here. You don't even need replication because the assumption here is that you write the, you put the, the index state but also the transaction log or bin log or whatever it's called in your data store. Um, that Even that is going to the blob store. So you have really no state that is only on an instance so you don't need to have any replication anymore. But your replication layer is basically relying on the instance store. So. As I've said before, state is still a thing, but it's somebody else's problem, and you're just relying on um, them doing a good enough job. But this basically allows you to scale different tiers independently. You don't need that replication that we've had before, um, so you potentially only need to index half as much data anymore because you don't need to do it twice, but only once. Um, and that should make it much easier for you to operate, and ideally also much cheaper because only writing the data once and scaling reading and writing independently. Whereas up here you can see if I have more reads, I need to scale the same components up or the same thing for ingestion. Whereas here I can have a more fine-grained approach and do that. Um, there are still a couple of challenges around that. These are slightly less search specific. For example, we have these master nodes that manage the state. We also want to make those stateless because otherwise scaling down to zero, for example, is not really a thing, but you always need to have this component that runs the data. Um, and we have 10 minutes left, yes. Um, you have the transaction log or bin log or whatever it's called in your data store that you need to keep somewhere. Like our approach again is that you can still put that on S3 and it will perform well enough to actually outsource all of that state. Um, we have one thing where gets, for example, are real-time, 
and how to implement that, but those are like more very specific implementation details, so I skip over those. Um, we've recently done some benchmarks um, where we have, in terms of ingestion, it is much faster, also because we only need to do it like once and not twice anymore. Um, and that then also needs a lot less CPU because you don't need the coordination between a primary and a replica, but you can only just write it once, go to the blob store, and then it's the blob store's problem. And if you have optimized like how much data you put together and write in one operation, since you normally pay for API requests and data transfer and everything, it can be a lot cheaper to run such a system. If your access patterns are bad, it might still be very expensive or even more expensive because of all the extra overhead from F3 that you need to run. Um, so to wrap up, stateless and serverless are a thing. I know that everybody wants to call everything cloud native nowadays, so maybe this is a cloud native data store because some providers are very keen on calling us as we are cloud native and others are not. And it's always a question of like, what does that really mean? And I think it's kind of like as our industry progresses, this stateless and serverless approach of outsourcing the work to somebody else is very appealing, and this will work well there. Um, one thing that sometimes comes up is like, isn't all of this just auto-scaling? And I hope we've made it clear that this is more than auto-scaling, um, that you just dynamically add more instances, but you can never go down to zero with auto-scaling and that you still manage everything in terms of state yourself, that serverless and stateless is more than just auto-scaling. Even though it might solve part of the same problem, it's really only, it's probably less than half of the solution, just because you need to think about state very differently in a serverless and stateless environment. Um, and with that, that's it. Do, we, do you have any questions? I'll try to repeat the questions for the recording. Uh, yes, please. So you talked about using the blob storage in the right pattern. Like, I guess that means that you should try, to, for example, send bigger ch chunks of data into it with less frequent requests. How do you then deal with uh, reliability on the process, which is kind of getting the data from from the user directly and feeding them into the blob storage? Yes, so the, the question was basically about the, the right access pattern for writing data and like the trade-off between having large enough data chunks and then writing the data um, frequently enough. So I'm, part of the solution here is this transaction log then. That so the, the basic assumption, at least for us, I think that's quite similar for most others, is that the write comes in, um, you, you batch a couple of transactions together and write that transaction log, and only then you acknowledge it back. The data then is still kept on that indexing here before being written to that index store, um, but the guarantee is basically it's in a transaction log. So if this node, whatever node here indexes your data dies, you can always get it out of the transaction log. So for the transaction log, you might have to the trade-off that you write smaller chunks of data, but for before you write, you create bigger chunks here um, that are then also easier to retrieve. So you don't have like a gazillion very small files, um, but you have larger chunks that ideally you prepare depending on your access pattern. So for example, if you have, I don't know, let's say anything that is close to a time series, like logs and anything with a timestamp, <coughs> um, you can then um, just sort the data in that and you retrieve like a, a span of time and you have like those data always put together so the retrieval is much simpler. In the transaction log you might have to have the trade-off that you do smaller and more requests just for the durability um, but that is the trade-off that the writing of the actual data which then goes into the searching and <coughs> in many scenarios that like, you will search way more often than you actually write the data um, that you can optimize for that. So um, there, there is a bit of a trade-off in the access patterns. Um, our assumption, I think, and the general assumption is that the data is being read more than it's written. So you want to batch that together in some format that optimizes for retrieving, like not too many data chunks, but fewer data chunks and larger ones, um, rather than having these tiny reads. Because yes, the, the access pattern from a local SSD is totally different than with these blob stores. Um, so that's kind of the, the way to go there. I hope that answered the question. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Any other questions?
Yes, please. So we uh, store a whole bunch of data in S3 for analytic purposes. And it is essentially a, a, around cost swapping, or cost plotting and cost partition. The way we partition it is by year and then month and then a date for each year pairing. So the question to you is, because we, are, we might not be at a high enough scale to notice the cost plotting, but do you think it is a best practice for you? So the question was um, hot spotting with a year, month, date pattern for writing. So your writes always go to the same. So it's, it's not historic data that you're processing, but it's basically today's data. So all your writes are basically going to today's bucket. Yes. I mean, I don't think it's, it's great in terms of distribution because you have this hot spotting. And depending on your cloud provider, you will find it in the documentation. So I, I, looked, I only picked the, the GCP example, um, which was here. But there is similar documentation for S3 and Azure as well. They all have, or, or maybe you need to talk to support. We, we've also spoken to support. Uh, maybe they don't make that super public because for many average scenarios, you don't feel it. But if you try to push the limit, you might. But hotspotting is, is generally a thing. I think S3 also has a, has a caching layer that for reading can kind of like offset that problem if you have to basically exploit locality that you always read the same bucket, um, that it will cache the data. But that's very S3 specific um, for reading. Um, and I think then it just depends on like the, the amount of data that you, you name. Our, I think our fear is that if we have like a very large client and they write to, to the same bucket because we have incremental buckets or whatever and all their writes always go to the same um, bucket that we might create a hotspot or that maybe we put three noisy customers close together um, and that we might not end well. I think as long as it's working, it's probably not a problem. <laughs> um, but yeah, hotspotting is it's still a thing. I mean, it's a classic IT problem, and I think even though it's abstracted behind five layers at this point, it's not really going away. And and on the negative side, you see there's hotspotting. On the positive side, you say like, oh, we exploit the uh, locality. Um, so I think it's a bit of a trade-off again. What what makes sense uh, and how it combines well. Anything else? Otherwise, thanks a lot for joining. If you want to have stickers, take some stickers so I don't have to carry them home. Um, and thanks a lot for joining. <laughs>